Welcome to Bethany Online. We're glad to have you here with us today. This is for the last Sunday of the church year, also called Christ the King Sunday. And uh, this is going to be on Sunday, November the 24th. However, whatever day it is that you're watching, whenever you can watch, whatever time, we're glad that you're here with us, that you're worshiping with us, and that we can worship together with you online. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. of your righteousness You have taken all of our shame and given us the gift of holiness Lord we're crying out for faith to believe the words you say You say we you say we belong to you your grace is enough nothing more that we can do you say we've been bought by your blood by your blood and all that we can say is amen A new hope, an anchor for the soul that shall not fail. Jesus, we believe your truth shines. Yes, in the darkest night you shall prevail. Lord, we're crying out for faith. You say, you say we are loved. You say we belong to you. Your grace is enough. Nothing more than we can do. You say we've been bought by your blood, by your blood, and all that we can say. For today comes from the Gospel of St. John, the 18th chapter, beginning at the 33rd verse. Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. 
If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. This is the word of the Lord. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Well, come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting there with open arms to his open arms for god so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in is waiting there with open arms. Grace, mercy, and peace is yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our gospel reading today says that Jesus came into the world. Jesus says he came into the world to testify to the truth. He is avoiding that whole question of, is he a king? Because Pilate's view on what a king is and an earthly view on what a king is has nothing to do with who Jesus is. He has been called the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, but all of that is to help us understand that which is beyond our understanding, that God came down in the form of Jesus and took human flesh. That God, who is spirit and uncontainable, took on the container of a human body. The incarnation is one of the most difficult things to even try to wrap our heads around, and we still don't get all of it. We do understand that the majesty of God was contained in a human body, that Jesus was both man and God at the same time, and it was difficult for people in his day to understand it, to recognize him, to see what was going on. And so as we look at Christ the King Sunday, this is one of those passages where that discussion goes on about, is he a king? And the passage ends just one verse before Pilate says in verse 38, what is truth? See, Jesus turns the conversation and and he says, I have come to testify to the truth. And Pilate says, what is truth? before he goes out to the crowds to try to see if he can somehow calm everything down, if he can somehow work out the situation. Perhaps we ask the similar question. 
Perhaps there are times in our lives when we say, but what is truth? What is the truth in the things that we're reading? What is the truth in our lives? What is the truth of the Bible? All those things, sometimes we'll ask that question. Now I have to tell you, Pilate asks the question because he's in trouble. Pilate is in a real difficult situation. His, his wife wakes up in the middle of the night with a nightmare and says, stay away from that man. Nothing good's going to come of this. Pilate has a struggle on his hands. And it's one that's not immediately evident from reading the Bible. You have to know the background story, the history on it. And for this, I go to a book written by the great Paul Meyer, who's one of the great theologians of our, of our time and historians of our time from the Lutheran Church. And Paul Meyer explains that Pilate had some issues. The big issue that he had is he couldn't get these rebellious Israelites to stop fighting him over everything. You see, you have to understand that while the Romans controlled Jerusalem and controlled Israel, they had allowed the Israelites, they had allowed the Jews to continue practicing their religion so that they didn't have to completely slaughter them because they realized there was going to be this all-out war. It was an all-or-nothing situation. So in order to keep a people there, a people who could produce, a people who could pay taxes, the Romans let them have their, their worship practices. But Pilate, as he so honestly says, is, I'm not a Jew. I'm not knowing who you are or who you're supposed to be. Pilate's honest at that moment. Sometimes we think he's just this evil person, but here he is. He's trying to rule in a place where he has power and authority from the Roman government, and yet he doesn't because he's got these rebellious people who are upset, and here's where they rebelled. Pilate wanted to honor Caesar. It's a smart thing to do. Caesar had given him the position. Caesar means God, and so Caesar, the one who is, who is over all of Rome, has given him this position, and he wants to pay tribute. And he puts up these bronze medallions in the city with pictures, graven images of Caesar. Well, there's the problem. Because the commandments say, thou shalt have no graven images. And in, on top of that, it says, you shall have no other gods before me. So not only is it a graven image, but it's a graven image of Caesar, which means God. And now these righteous, God-fearing Jews are finding this in their city, and they rebel. And it is an all-out war. And Meyer helps us understand the history books tell us that there was blood literally flowing down the streets. There was that much warfare. There were that many people who, who died. And there had been some smaller uprisings, and there were rumors of all kinds of things happening. And so Caesar sent an emissary, sent someone to say to Pilate, look, one more problem, and you're going to have to come see me. And Pilate knew that lots of governors who went and saw Caesar never came back. They were put to death. And so Caesar had a problem. Once again, this rebellious group is upset, and they're upset over this guy named Jesus, and he doesn't understand what it's about, and he doesn't understand why they're so upset with him, and he's trying to figure out how to fix this, and he brings Jesus in and says, are you the king of the Jews? Are you, the, are you their king? Is that why they're upset? Are they trying to overthrow the king? And Jesus doesn't give the answers he wants. Jesus isn't hurtful or hateful. He doesn't fight with him, but he just lays out what he thinks Pilate can understand, tries to show him who he is. And so the problem that Pilate has is this. He's got Jesus who's trying to explain to him a truth that is different than anything Pilate can grasp, while over here he's got something that could end not just his governorship, not just the nice life that he had, but life itself. All of this is on the line. Pilate faces this no-win situation. Seems like a no-win situation. He's either got to do something to Jesus that he, in his heart, believes is wrong, or he's got to face the fact that his life is going to be taken from him because he'll have a rebellion going on. He'll have to put it down with troops. And that was that next time he'd have to go back to Rome and meet with Caesar. You know, my friends, we face situations like this ourselves. We face situations in our lives that really are no-win situations. Now, <clears throat> when I say that to you, what I am saying to you is that there are situations in life where we are faced with things 
where we either do something wrong or we do something wrong. There doesn't seem to be, and maybe there isn't, a path that leads us to doing the right thing or doing something that is pure and holy. Now, let me just right away say to you, some people will contend that those no-win situations do not exist. To them, I would say, you've got to read some, some, some deep writings. There's one by C.S. Lewis where he talks about a lot of these things, gets into how there can be things where we have a no-win situation. But more than that, I would say this leads us to a place that we call legalism. God wrote it. It's in the Bible. There's right and there's wrong. There's this and there's that. And you either do the right thing or you don't do the right thing. It always applies. And St. Paul is really good at laying out how if you go down that road, you make Jesus' death and resurrection worthless. If you go down that road, you have reinstituted the law and we all fall short of the glory of God by the law. Paul's very clear that legalism is not the path of truth. Legalism is a path that takes us the wrong direction. It feels good, though, because there are these rules. We know right from wrong. And clearly, the law serves to show us where we err, to show us our sins. And it also, as Luther puts it, is a way for us to try to live up to what we want to do because of God's forgiveness. But that's, that's the important part, grace coming in there. Jesus came to testify to the truth. And we'll get to what that truth is in a moment. But it is an all-encompassing grace, a love of God that would wash away the sins of the world. Now, some will contend when I say that there are no-win situations. Some will contend there's no such thing because we always win. There are no real rules. Jesus' love and grace has come and it has forgiven us and we can do anything we want to do because it's always there for us and we don't need to worry about a thing. We don't even need to try. Now, you don't hear that as often. There's a name to that as well. We've got legalism over here, over here. We have what's called antinomianism. You may not have heard that word before because it's not used a lot. Antinomianism means you just don't believe that the laws apply at all. There's no, no, there's no purpose for them. There's, there's no meaning. And that's wrong as well. It's easier for us to see that that one is wrong because, well, there are rules in our lives. We have governments that make rules. We have rules in our families. We have rules at our work. We have rules at school. And if you disobey the rules, things happen. Things that are not good happen. There are punishments. There are problems. All kinds of things can happen. And so we've got these two ends of the spectrum. And oftentimes, by the way, as Christians, we get labeled as one or the other. Oftentimes we get labeled as being legalists because we still say there are rules and there are ways that we should live our lives, not have to, but should because we understand God's grace and love and mercy, and this is the better way to live, but we also know that we fail and we receive that forgiveness. That's the tension. But then... Likewise, when we talk about that grace and that mercy, people say, see, they don't believe in any rules at all. You can get away with anything, and all you have to do is say you're sorry, and God forgives you, which is true, but that's not what the intent is. It's not to stand over here and thumb our nose at the rules and say that they don't exist. Living in that tension is not always easy, but it is clear that there will be no-win situations in our lives. And in those no-win situations, we will tend to say, so what is truth? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to navigate this? And I'm going to give you an early clue. We have to rely on God's grace. We can't try to remake the law, but we also can't live up to it. In other words, we can't take it away, but we can't live up to it. We have to live in that place where God's grace is what sustains us. But we also face a world where the word truth, or what is the truth, seems to be constantly changing and redefined. Sometimes we can see that just in the words that people use. Words suddenly have some meaning that some people understand and some people don't, and some people say this is a bad thing and this is a good thing, and sometimes I, the older I get, the more confused I get. 
Because some words that are used, I, I just, I, and, and what does that mean anyway? And one person's using it to define this, and another person's using it to define it that way. How do we know? And even concepts. People will say, well, this is why this happened, or this is why that happened. And there will be disagreement. Some of those are righteous disagreements. By righteous, what I mean is someone knows the history on this, and the history on that is different, and there are different ways they see things. So what is truth, we ask? We end up in that same place, trying to figure out how to lead our lives as godly people who believe in Jesus, who follow the one who went to the cross and died for our sins. Ah, but that's the truth. In fact, as we ask that question, what is truth, the irony is, for Pilate, he asks the question, so what is truth? And the irony is, truth is the one standing in front of you. Truth is the one you're going to send to the cross when you wash your hands and you give him to the people and you free Barabbas, who is a criminal. Truth is that there's nothing you can do, Pilate. You are going to be known as the one who sent Jesus to his death, and many will blame you. Truth is, Pilate, you will not be able to quell all of the rebellions, and your life may not be what you've wanted it to be. But the truth is found in the one who will go to the cross and die for your sins, will die so that you can be raised up one day and be in heaven, if only you believe in him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the irony. Pilate is looking for the truth. He is stuck in that same mess that we ourselves find ourselves in. We don't know what to do. We don't know what to believe about our world. We don't know who to listen to. All of these things coming at us. And our mind swirling says, what is truth? The irony is, and the important thing for us to remember is, Jesus is there. Jesus is with us. The truth is there. And we believe in that truth when we believe in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Pilate does what is God's will and what is the truth. Conquers sin. Pilate sends Jesus to his death. He is the only one who has the power to do so. He sends Jesus to be crucified. And in doing so, fulfills God's plan and God's will for salvation for the whole world, for all of time. Pilate was a part of that salvation plan. A part that was important and necessary. And similarly, what you do in Christ, what I do in Christ, what we do in Christ our Lord, may not seem right at the moment, but we can trust that it is God's will. We can trust that the truth, Jesus, will be conquering sin through the things that we do. And that God is greater than all of the things that we hear about in this world, all of the things we struggle with, all of the decisions of human beings. God is greater than all of that. And God works through all of that. It doesn't mean we should like sin. It doesn't mean we should try to change it. It doesn't mean we should pretend it doesn't exist. It means we live in that space, and instead of calling attention, maybe you should call it a protected space, where the inner side can harm us, and we win because of Jesus. We win because of Jesus who faced down the no-win situation with Pilate. Pilate was facing it, and Jesus rose above it for him, for us, and for our salvation. So when we share the truth, when we share God's grace, when we share God's mercy, when we share God's love, we do so rather than legalism, rather than antinomianism. We do so because Christ came to fulfill the law for us, to testify to the truth, that God loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, that whosoever would believe in him
would have eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running and there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you sought to the other side knowing this was our salvation jesus for our sake you died Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was poor, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. And by his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who is resurrected me. Will you pray with me? Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we feel stuck. Oftentimes we feel stuck. We feel like there's a no-win situation in front of us. We want to do something or we don't want to do something, and we feel like both apply. We struggle, Lord, and we pray that you would help us to understand that in the midst of our desire to know what is true, what is right, what is best, you are there with us. That your Holy Spirit is there testifying to Jesus, who testifies to the truth, which is the grace and mercy and peace that you bring to us. So, Lord, we ask that you would walk with us this week again, that you would remind us of your truth, 
that you would remind us of your grace and mercy, that you would make us ambassadors of your peace to bring that light and that love and that joy to others. We pray, O oh Lord, as we head into the week where we give thanks, that you would help us truly be thankful, that you would remind us that it is more than the, the dinners and celebrations, more than being together as family, more than the football games, more than whatever our traditions are. It is about giving thanks. And so we pray, O oh Lord, a prayer of thanksgiving, that you are the one who loves us at all, all times, who has had mercy on us at all times, and who brings us peace that passes all understanding. We pray that you would be with those who are in more desperate struggles, desperate struggles because of their physical or mental or emotional health, those who are facing adversity, adversity from natural disasters, adversity from wars and rumors of war, adversities from lack of food and shelter and clothing. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless us, your people, to be a blessing to others, to care for the needs of others. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would hold the sick in your healing hands and that you would guide and direct all of us to know that you walk with us and you would bring comfort to us in the midst of our most difficult times. Pray also, Lord, for those who are celebrating, and as we celebrate Thanksgiving, as we celebrate birthdays and anniversaries, we pray that you would bring joy to us and help us to remember that that joy is found in your presence and in our faith in Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Quick note to let you know that... Uh, it's raining today as I, as I film this. Whether it's raining or sunshiny on Saturday, we will be packing up food baskets to go out to people who are in need of food. Uh, we have indoor and outdoor ways of doing that. And uh, we thank those of you who are able to give to the Thanksgiving food baskets. We will do it all again at Christmas. So there are ways online for you to give to our backpacks we do for the homeless and for the food baskets that we give to people who are in need. Those are actually two very separate groups. We support a group called Project We Hope that uh, helps the homeless. We do help them with a uh, Christmas party. They do a dinner once a year for Christmas, and we hand out backpacks at that. And they are thankful for those, those necessities of life that go to them. So thank you for being a part of that, a part of our desire to show God's love and to bring it into the world. You can still do that by going on to the website, bethany-mp.org. We're happy to have your contributions. Have a blessed Thanksgiving.